Hey you guys, it's Sarah with House Copper. It's like 43 degrees today um, in Wisconsin in January, which is amazing and like never happens and everybody is really worried the end of the world is coming, hopefully not. But because of that, between the heater and this enclosed space and it being like 40 some degrees, it's actually really warm in here, especially with the fire. So um, I'm just sharing the joy of Wisconsin not cold winter with you. But anyway, today I am going to be building um, one of the pieces for the house copper line, the egg spoon. And the reason I'm doing it is because it kind of shows just a tiny bit of everything, like the, um, um, the, the riveting process really briefly, um, especially riveting by hand, you know, just hammering and the cleaning process that kind of goes around making the rivets nice. And then also um, the tinning process that I do and it's like a really quick one so that it's not like the whole pot, but if you're doing something kind of flat, easy and small, this is a really great um, and easy to see tinning process. Um, the, uh, just a bit of history, the egg spoons traditionally like weren't called egg spoons um, in the old books, in the books about uh, cookware coming from France that are in French that go back. There, there is nothing called an egg spoon, but really um, the way I understand it and just my hypothesis is that the uh, the egg spoon was basically a large ladle that was used in open fire or hearth cooking, um, and it you know it's just the shape for like one egg, and you can stick it in the fire and just fry yourself up an egg really easily. And with it being copper, it's really quick. Um, but funny because these spoons were traditionally just spoons; they were never tin lined, and so a lot of copper egg spoons you might see on the market, some of them are going for hundreds of dollars, um, they're not lined with tin, which I find interesting because then if you're frying an egg on them, like the eggs are gonna stick. But um, so we um, are gonna do tin lined uh, egg spoons and I think I'm the only one who does tin lined egg spoons because I just think like, why not make it a non-stick egg spoon, tiny skillet thing. And so we're gonna do that. But so that's like the little bit of fun history behind the egg spoon. And uh, we're just gonna go, we're gonna make one cause I have an order for like a lot. And um, if you have any questions about it, uh, as I go, try and remember and ask them at the bottom and uh, let's go build one. So here is my blacksmithing anvil. And then on top of this is a cast iron blacksmith like swedge block I, is really what it's called. And it comes with all different ways that you can, you know, make rounded or tri uh, like triangular shapes. Um, and the other side has like for spoons and smaller diameters, but I start with this. And then because it is cast iron and no matter how much I sand this, it's always gonna be like really abrasive and uh, copper is very soft. So I do usually put something down. Sometimes when I use the switch black, I use something thick. This is a nice piece of brain tanned elk hide, cause why not? Um, but it's too thick for um, this process. And you know, this will wear quick, um, but you set um, your blank. So this is my blank for my egg spoon that I cut out of a nice thick, it's really thick um, copper. And then I have a really nice planishing hammer with a pretty nice face here. Nothing super pointy like this. I know it doesn't look pointy, but it actually does do a really pretty tight point. So this has a nice start. And you, when you raise something like, like this, like a shallow bowl, um, you start in the middle and then you kind of spiral your way all the way to the outside and then you spiral your way all the way back to the inside. And the reason you're gonna do that and you're not just gonna start hammering right in the middle is because doing that will kink your, um, kink your material in random places. And then it's actually, it kind of has muscle memory and the kink will, come constantly come back and you're gonna be fighting that for the rest of your raising. So you're gonna see me start in the middle and work my way out. And it does take a lot. So there's gonna be a lot of hammering and I'll just fast forward through it. And we'll get to the end, but we'll start. So that was the first round. And just to show you, so we've got some hammering and it's slightly curved, like barely started. So it takes a lot of circular hammering. And then I'll switch to 
a larger hammer like this if I need to, but this usually will do the job. And now I'll start, and then I'm gonna twist it just a little, just so that I can make sure my hammer strokes are kind of all hitting different spots at different times. And now you can really start seeing that curve coming in. Okay, it's a nice shallow shape. It'll hold an egg. And uh, now it's time to rivet uh, and do the riveting process. Because this is a curved surface here, um, drilling makes it is a lot trickier to do just because the drill likes to walk when it's coming on a curved surface like this. So I will use this kind of, the wrought iron handle that is already, I already drilled it. And then if you, you can actually see, there's a like a slight curve to here so that it fits the shape of this. So that was done also on the swedge block so that it matches the kind of the, the the radius of this so it's a nice real nice snug fit onto that shape but I'm going to use this to mark not just with like a like a dry erase marker or a pen or anything but you're actually going to stamp this to uh, take drilling for rivets um, a lot easier make it a lot easier for you so I'm gonna use a, this, this is called a mushroom uh, stake, a mushroom head stake. If you don't have something like this, like in like it's tinner and coppersmith's tool. So if you don't have it, something with anything close that is hard, that has the kind of interior uh, radius and, and shape that you can get a nice solid um, area. And you're gonna, I'm gonna fit this right where I want it. And then, can see them. There's marks right there that are indented so that I, uh, we can go to the drill. As always, after drilling, you may have some burrs. I do here. You definitely want to get those off. You can use a Dremel or a sanding tool. I like to use the deburrer, which I know I've done a video on how to use. <laughs> There you go again. And then just because drilling and copper, uh, drilling is so, is, you know, drilling, but copper is so soft, even though it looks, these look round, they probably are not perfect. And so you can use some sort of tool to kind of really make sure that these are round. Otherwise the rivets can give you trouble or get stuck when you're doing the next step. So those rivets slide in nice. There we go. I like to do both at the same time, just because then, um, then you're dealing with not having to retrofit later. It just makes for a much easier situation. And if they don't go in right away, you can kind of force it by hammering around the rivets. All right. And then, holding the rivet head onto your metal, you just start to mushroom the heads and go back and forth to guarantee that they are on. So we have a nice tight handle. We've got flat rivets on the inside, which is exactly what we want. And so now actually, before I go anywhere, uh, when you hand hammer rivets, they mushroom. Um, and I'm doing this because not everybody has 
the tools to do round headed rivets um, when, you know, to do the, the, the roundedness of the shank when they are riveting. Everybody has a hammer though. So that's why I'm doing it this way. Um, so this is gonna be a little sharp, usually on the very edges of your rivets where you've mushroomed them. So now this is where the little detailing comes in. We're going to clean that up just using, you can use sandpaper, but a Dremel um, or some sort of, uh, you know, uh, mechanical uh, sanding is ideal. Here's a fun tinning trick. Um, I use basic drywall mud that's a little watered down. I kind of keep water right in the middle and I use that to protect this. Surfaces like this tend to get a lot of drips. The tin just kind of runs right off and you end up with all kinds of tin you have to like then grind off later. and It doesn't always leave as nice of a finish. So if you can protect your copper, um, that is ideal. And like I said, this type of shape um, pots, not so much, it kind of splashes out nice, but a shape that's more like this, you can get a ton of drips if you don't protect it. So, um, and it washes off really nice after, but wherever you put the little kind of watered down drywall mud, you will not get tin. And sometimes I even kind of put it on the rivets just in case. So, all right, we'll let it dry and then we'll put it over the fire for some tin. Okay, so there's our egg spoon. I'm using a whole bunch of techniques, you know, whether that's drilling and prepping to drill and riveting and tinning, which hopefully was really easy to see. You know, you have to let it heat and then it's ready and then you have to go fast. So uh, if you have any thoughts or questions about any of the processes you saw here, um, chances are there's other videos that go into a lot of this in more detail. But if you do have any thoughts or comments, please put them down in the comments below. And then don't forget to find me on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok under House Copper or look for Copper Iron and Clay where books are sold or subscribe or share the love and tell everybody about, you know, how they need to learn sheet metal and watch this channel. Anyway, thank you again for watching. Thank you for being here and I will see you next time.